Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, today I'll talk about how AMP Story works with and in spite of AMP. And what that means is that I'll talk a little bit about like the interesting things that we have gone through while developing stories and building it on top of AMP, which is basically building a framework on top of another framework. Quick introduction, my name is Enrique. I'm a software engineer on the AMP Stories team. Um, in this office, this is my GitHub handle, and I'll present it at the end in case you want to reach out as well. And just to get everyone up to speed, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the context of what story is and what we say and what we call uh, a story and specifically an AMP story. So a story is a interactive, tappable format, uh, usually lives in the phones, um, you might have heard of it from Instagram or Snapchat, and it's this very visual and interactive um, uh, format. And um, specifically for stories, we have these the same format, but in the web. So you can find it not only in a wall garden, such as a, a native app, but you can find it in your blog, in your website, or maybe even in some search engine. It's uh, searchable and indexable, so it includes all of the web standards that you would normally have in a website as well. And it was uh, mobile first, but it actually works well across different devices. It, uh, and specifically, AMP Story follows the same navigational model as a story where you tap to go from one page to the other. And it's built on top of AMP, which means that it leverages a lot of the tools that AMP already provides, like AMP Analytics, and um, some other AMP components as well. Cool, now, now that we're on the same page and we know what AMP story and hopefully what AMP is, um, we can start moving towards more specifics and a natural transition is to kind of compare what a regular site, com um, how does it compare to a story in its format. So if we take a look at a regular mobile site, we can see that it's uh, a lot of scrollable content. You might have a picture here and there, maybe a video, you have some text in between, and you could also probably have some links which you can click on. Uh, and this, is, this can like, look pretty familiar to everyone. But uh, story is very different. You would have pages that are maybe laid out in a different way. You tap to go from one page to the other. Um, there's not a lot of scrolling happening, maybe because you're, you're just tapping to go from one page to the other. There's probably also not a lot of clicking because there's not a lot of links or there's not a lot of um, interactions happening inside the story. So with this, I want to talk a lot about, about a few points, and my slide is not displaying correctly, but uh, I'll, I'll just go with it. Uh, <laughs> I'll improvise. Um, so I think actually is the color. The color is too white for the, no, it should display actually. Anyways, it's fine. Um, so the, so whenever we compare, for example, content loading in a regular site versus a story, <laughs> Um, whenever we're talking about preloading content as soon as uh, the user is moving throughout the viewport. And I'll bring back this other slide, whoops, um, that I was showing here with the article. Um, as you know, as the user is scrolling and content is coming close to the viewport, we would usually, you know, enjoy some lazy loading provided by the AMP runtime where you know, images and videos that move closer to the runtime get loaded as soon as they're getting close to the viewport. But for stories, how would that work? Because if we put all the pages together, then it would mean that all of the content behind each of the pages would get loaded immediately, even if the user maybe never gets to the 50th page. So imagine if there's a story that is 100 pages long and we try to load everything at once, putting everything together, then that would be a very bad user experience because it would bottleneck the whole uh, initial load because we're trying to load stuff that comes after the fact or that the user maybe even uh, won't see later. 
So what we try, so what we did here, we actually just used CM CSS and we leveraged AMP's uh, lazy loading logic. So what we actually do is we actually just move pages far away from the viewport and we keep only pages that are close to the, the user that the user will probably see soon, close to the viewport. So with this, we actually enjoy AMP's lazy loading by default. Uh, since the pages and the content is close to the viewport, we automatically enjoy that lazy loading um, that, and that preloading that, that AMP is doing in the background. And as soon as the user is traversing from one page to the other, we move these pages closer and farther away um, respectively from the viewport to uh, leverage AMP's, uh, AMP's lazy loading. And what we only had to do here is actually just use some CSS, uh, some CSS to move pages uh, close and further away. Cool. So the next point is clicks. And in a regular site, uh, this would be pretty straightforward. Uh, whenever you're trying to click on something, something happens, right? But in a story format, whenever you're having this tappable interactive format and the main, interact, the main navigational model is to tap to go from one page to the other, then if I click on this link, what do you think should happen? And this actually was a big challenge for us that took us uh, quite a bit to get right. And um, so because the, the question is so simple, but since it's a new format and some people are doing different things, we're wondering what's the, what's the right way of doing it. So what we came up with is this tooltip interaction. So whenever you click on a link, we first show a tooltip to ask the user to confirm that they actually want to perform that action. And then given that they confirm that action, we actually navigate to the page. And this actually solves the problem of when a user is tapping through a story and then they would click on a link and then they would go somewhere else and maybe do something that they didn't want to do in the first place. So uh, this addresses that issue here. And actually, this tooltip component is built on a shadow DOM, which means that it cannot be um, overridden in styles by the publisher. And this also allows us to better control what the user experience is for the user. Cool. And the third point I wanted to bring out is media. So, uh, in stories, you would normally have a lot of autoplay media. So when you go from one page to the other, you would have a video that starts playing, and then you go to the next page, and another video starts playing. Uh, but this is actually tricky on the web because web um, web browsers don't really like stuff to be autoplayed without any user interaction. Um, so what this means for stories, when you're navigating from one page to the other automatically. There's no user interaction. So how do you make that media element play on the next page? So what we came up with, and actually another challenge that I uh, forgot to mention here, is that some devices have a set limit of media elements that you can have at one point playing. So if, uh, for example, in a story you have 20 videos, you can ha can't have all 20 videos playing at once. Um, and this is a huge challenge for stories because since it's a, such an interactive, such a visual uh, format, uh, given this hardware limit, uh, it's kind of uh, a challenge for us. So to solve these two issues, we came up with a concept called Media Pool, which is basically a pool that shares resources. And instead of using the same elements that are on the DOM, we swap them out in and out of the DOM and recycle those same elements. And with this, we can actually solve the problem or the hardware li uh, limit of uh, 15 elements per page. And uh, we do this by just smartly swapping them in and out uh, as, as the user progresses through the story. And um, for the autoplay issue, we actually use a um, concept. Um, we solve it using a concept that we call a blessing or that the web community calls blessing where we use a user interaction. And given that user interaction, we save it for later uh, out of playing uh, some media elements or blessing those media elements that can later be out of played by us. 
Cool. Uh, for the next point, analytics. Um, analytics can be very different for stories. So if you're in your own site and you're measuring, for example, page views, uh, you would normally measure page views um, by you know how a, 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 a user is traversing from one page to the other. Maybe they're like looking at your website, they're scrolling, they're clicking on links, and then when they go from one link to the other, you count that as uh, one page view. Um, but for stories, the main point of stories is to go from one page to the other. So this may actually seem kind of inflated for your users when you're looking at metrics for a story. Because to get the full sense of a story inside of an AMP story, you would really need to go through different pages to really know what's going on. Whereas in a normal page, you would probably just scroll in and out of the page uh, up and down to know what's happening. So what we came up with for our stories is custom triggers, uh, some custom triggers that better reflect kind of like the concept of a story. So for example, in a story we have progress, which means how far in a story a user has progressed. And then we have another trigger that's called, for example, uh, story complete, um, which tells us when a user has finished reading a story. Uh, even though these uh, these triggers are custom. We actually use still the same AMP analytics component that you would normally use in your site in, uh, in AMP. So in a regular AMP site, you would have your AMP analytics tag. Inside, you would have some configuration like your triggers and maybe your Google Analytics ID and stuff like this. Um, and the only thing that changes here is the name of the trigger. So in this case, we have a custom trigger. It's called uh, Story Page Visible. And this is triggered whenever a, a user traverses from one or changes from one page to the other. Cool. So now that I was talking a little bit about the differences between a regular site and a story, I'd like to talk about more specifically how in stories we use M. And given that really AMP is just a framework to create a well-lit path of creating websites. AMP Story does the same for stories. It's just a well-lit path to create performant, <laughs> lightweight framework, um, to create performant and lightweight stories that provide a very good user experience. Um, so let's start with the anatomy of an AMP Story. So, an AMP story is actually built of different components. Uh, a story itself is built by pages, which in themselves contain layers. And then inside the layers, you can have all, all these elements that you'd want, like images, text, videos, et cetera. Um, and actually, all these different components are AMP components in, it, in themselves. So we know that AMP story is a, is a component, but actually, the page is actually called AMP Story Page, which is an AMP component again. And then the layers, AMP Story Grid Layer, is another component in itself. So if you're following, actually, AMP Story has its own component library out of itself. And this helps us better orchestrate and better um, kind of um, run the resources inside of Story and the interaction that follows uh, a story in itself. Um, and just to give kind of more context of how this happens, when we, when we see the life cycle of a story or actually starting from just a regular AMP document, um, we can first start by looking at how it gets loaded. We, we first load the v0.js, which is the library that contains the AMP runtime. Um, then we also import AMP Story JS, which is the extension that imports AMP Story and all its, its functionality. And this actually overrides AMP base element callbacks. Um, and these callbacks are provided by the runtime. And then we only take those, run, uh, those callbacks and then we override them with AMP Story specific behavior. So these callbacks, the main ones are the build callback and the layout callback. The build callback is concerned with building elements and making sure that we have the correct DOM structure before actually displaying any content or loading any resources. 
And then the layout callback is concerned with actually loading those resources and rendering some content inside the story. So by following these guidelines, we actually help ourselves because it helps us later down on the road do things like preloading and pre-rendering uh, while also saving bandwidth and providing a better user experience for the user. Uh, for example, uh, when we put everything together in, you know, we have our build callback and layout callback, and then um, we're trying to do, for example, this new feature where we're trying to pre-render some stories or pre-render the first page of a story, we know that we shouldn't be layout, uh, doing the layout on all of the next story, but only the first page of the story. So stuff like this uh, helps us better provide tools for our future in, in future development um, that we actually maybe not didn't see at the beginning, but by following these guidelines, it helped us down the road. Um, another cool tool that we use a lot inside uh, stories is uh, Gate Layout Box. This is a tool provided by AMP. So this gives us a cached measurement of the layout of, the, of an element box. So regularly we would do, for example, um, in this to measure uh, the measurements of a story page element, we would do a lot of uh, get bounding client rects. And this is very expensive. This is a very expensive operation because the browser has to calculate all the layout and has to see you know, what that element fits and how it relates to other elements. Uh, but AMP already provides a function that's called get layout box, which provides kind of like a cached version of those measurements so we don't have to measure them by ourselves. Another cool thing that AMP provides is resources. So you may know it from other places or other names, uh, such as FastDOM, for example. And what it basically does, it avoids layout thrashing by batching DOM read write operations into batches, of course. And, uh, and this helps us a lot because in stories, we do a lot of measurements and mutations. And sometimes it's very hard to know when your code base is growing very big to know when actually do some measurements before some mutations and stuff like this. So AMP really helps us stay kind of on the good path of uh, separating these and being uh, good at performance. Um, basically, what I wanted to come down to in this talk is that following AMP design principles really drives us a better road. It helps us, you know, sometimes it's hard to follow the design principles of one framework, but at the end, for, for us, it was better because it provides us a better, it forces us to be very conscious about performance and uh, the user experience that at the end is what matters the most. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I came up with this slide. I uh, just wanted to, I think, end up in a good note that even though there's some difficulties uh, building a framework on top of another framework, at the end, I think it's a good thing. And I think that's it for me. Uh, Thank you for listening. This is my GitHub handle in case you want to reach out. We are also on Slack in case you have any questions. And that's it for me. Thanks.